So I think we have our closing presentation today from Dr. Jean-Thomas Acoeva, as our research team leader at DDN. Okay, so thanks a lot, uh, Bom, for introducing the infrastructure topic. So now we are going to talk a bit about infrastructure and hopefully a way to make your infrastructure more efficient. So maybe not more powerful, but more efficient so you can get more value out of your infrastructure. So myself, I'm working at DDN since a few years now and I'm handling basically collaborative research with customers at the European level. So this idea is that, you know, we have uh, multiple things uh, around AI. So I guess during uh, the day, we, we have touched uh, multiple topics. And obviously, for a single infrastructure, being able to handle this diversity is a bit challenging. So we are going to see what kind of solution or work around we are trying to provide. So. I will say this is my personal statement, but I guess this is kind of aligned with what we have uh, discussed today already, is that AI is is still growing. So it's not, we are not, you know, on the downward slope, we are still increasing. So we see new customers coming in, and we even see new customers who are basically buying time to market. You know, they just, oh, we want to buy an AI solution because we need to start to do AI now. So it's not like re uh, refreshing an existing infrastructure. So there is still a lot of momentum behind AI. And I think some scientific field have not been uh, as uh, bold as else uh, life science is doing with AI. So there is still a lot of things to do in hardcore science with AI. So I'm pretty optimistic about the fact that it's going to unfold further. So it means that um, when you do AI, sadly, <laughs> there is, it's not super simple because we are dealing with complexity. And one of the issues is to move from the initial idea, the proof of concept, to putting things into production. So we need to calibre the infrastructure in a way that we are going to be able to scale, we are going to be able to handle unexpected things. So it's a very uh, simplistic view. So let's say that for us, what are the three key things uh, when we think about data on AI? So of course, we have kind of a data perspective here. So one of the issues that w there is many uh, acquisition device. So it's not like pure numerical simulation that we used to do in HPC. I have a big code, I'm writing data, everything is fine. I have acquisition device. So we've seen some extremely uh, sophisticated uh, um, a microscope uh, earlier in the afternoon. You have also uh, genomics. You have still the numerical simulation. And um, not only uh, there is diversity of acquisition device, but also the, the data themselves, they, they differ. So it could be a large bunch of data. It could be a lot of very small files, for example, for genomics. We could have a lot of metadata, or maybe not at metadata at all, large I.O., small I.O., object, file. So we need to be able to ingest everything. So it's not, from a storage standpoint, it's not that obvious, I would say. The second thing is that, by definition, AI is kind of a pipeline. So you have to do the data acquisition, curation, processing, analysis of the result. And so there is different phases. And each phase is in the infrastructure. You, tend to be on a different setting. So how do you convey all your data through this journey? It's not that obvious as well. And there is one specific specific thing, uh, and I, I was very pleased to, to, to see this in the previous uh, talk from Marie, is that because this is life science, there is additional regulation. So we cannot handle this as we do with nuclear experiment. No, here also we have to, we may need to do anonymization, we may uh, need to do encryption, we may have to enforce multi-tenancy, so even the sysadmin is not able to look at the data themselves, so how do you uh, provide, I would say, security, audited, uh, the fact that your system could be audited, and so on, in your uh, data solution. So overall, so there is many, many things that we are trying to do, on. Of course, there is not a, a magic solution which is able to handle everything perfectly. So what we try to, to build at DDN is something which is versatile, so flexible. So we can tweak it and we can optimize it depending on your need. So if you want to, to do a lot of data protection, we have all the features to deploy this on the field, but maybe you would like more for performance. So there is kind of a discussion here that we can uh, have in order to build the most suitable storage system for your uh, workload. So overall, the idea is not just to have infrastructure for infrastructure, even if I'm an IT person. 
So the goal is that basically we would like to, and what we are trying to do is to remove the storage from the performance equation. So the, the core of the infrastructure is the GPU, basically, for AI. That's pretty clear. So what you want to be sure is that your GPU is going to run full speed all the time and it's not going to wait for data. So the idea is that if we are able to provide data at a reasonable pace to the, to the processing unit, then you will be able to produce better science or let's say to get faster time to result. So typically, if we move from a traditional uh, standard vanilla NFS to even something which is kind of accelerated with a modern network, so uh, RDMA over uh, Ethernet, or something which is, I would say, designed for AI, like uh, the, the things that we are building at DDN, we can get, I will say, one or two order of magnitude in order to time to result. Even if we were able to do faster system, actually, we will not be able to go faster. So here, in, in this case, we are very uh, happy because basically the GPU is uh, fully loaded 100% of the time. So there is no storage in the performance equation anymore. This is pure processing. So we did our job. Now this is for you to analyze the result. So looking at the various phases, so there is this acquisition. So as I mentioned earlier, one of the issues is the diversity of the protocol that we need to of the systems are still running on Windows, right? So you need to have a fast Windows client able to handle gigabyte per second. It's not trivial. You need also to be, to, to be able to export the data, to move the data out of the acquisition facility to your uh, core processing unit. Then, of course, you need to feed the GPU at a reasonable pace and you want to analyze the result, and ultimately, once everything has been done, the science has been done, you want to archive everything, because you need to reproduce the result, maybe in the nearby future. So we try to package everything in a single hardware box. So it's small unit, you know, it's very small. Actually, there is a lot of technology into it, so it's full tolerant, so you can remove a plug, the other controller will take over the drive, if the drive dies, the other drive will be able to rebuild the data, so there is a lot of, I will say, hardware uh, challenges that has been solved into this box, but most of the value for AI is actually in the software side, so it's really, of course, the, the core thing is the hardware, but there is a lot of uh, software development which has been done just to, uh, I will say, motivated by this uh, uh, new AI demand. So multiple protocol, uh, various capabilities in terms of uh, object and files, encryption, all, all of these things, and we try to package everything in this single box. So at the end, the idea is that you can start with a small storage solution, you have all the feature in, and if your POC or your initial research project is successful and then you try to, to grow, we will be able to uh, extend to scale up your system by just adding more boxes. So basically, you will get performance and capacity without suddenly discovering that there is a bottleneck in the system that you have not thought about. Like, oh, my network is not fast enough. No, because when you add storage, basically, you add also the network capabilities. At least this is the idea. And of course, we want to, to share this, uh, this data, to have everything on a single box, but you, we want to keep control. So, okay, you, it's not because this is a shared infrastructure that it's an open bar, right? So I, I need to be sure that there is multi-tenancy. So a tenant, for instance, may not be aware of the existence of, the existence of other tenants. So a, a stakeholder in the system is not aware of the existence of the other stakeholder. There is no way to see that there is another home directory. It's, it's hidden. We can encrypt the data if needed, which means that you generate data and they are going to be encrypted all the way along to the archive. So that's, and of course, without too much uh, performance overhead. And there is this notion of, of actionable metadata. So people want to implement ontology. So typically to avoid that their data lake is becoming a data swamp. So you have a, a huge amount of data, but you need to have metadata to tag the data. And so you can basically decide to archive this data, or this one should be moved in this specific facility. On this one, they need to be triplicate, triplicated because they are super important, and you want to be able to um, trigger action based on this metadata. So among this idea of providing a software around the solution itself, so there is this idea that, okay, it's a bit complicated, so we need to provide as much information about what's going on in the storage as possible, so we have this panoptic monitoring, 
So we start, of course, by allowing the sysadmin to look at the infrastructure itself. Or I have one fan uh, or one socket which is overheating, one controller die. So I mean, this is quite important actually. But, but this is really the gory detail of the infrastructure. And there is the, the question about the service which is provided by this infrastructure, so the performance itself. So here we have the ability, uh, basically, to look at um, the performance, the usage, because it's a shared resource. So the resource usage on a per stakeholder, per job, per user, on per node basis. So it's very good for accountability. And also, it's quite convenient to detect what we call deviant job. So basically, the new guy arriving on the chain infrastructure and generating a storm of metadata, then you are able to detect this and, OK, this one, maybe I need to look at it, what's going on here. Is it really needed, or is it just because this is badly programmed? And there is this notion of data governance, so I can basically monitor my uh, data lake and take the, the right action in terms of resource allocation, metadata, and data management. So at the end, because people are you now changing, so they don't want to have CLI anymore, they want to have like fancy GUI. So we have kind of dashboard. You can look at the resource consumption, but also you can look at this job. You can look also, you can doing some analytics, so you can query basically the status of your, of your infrastructure, I mean storage infrastructure. So what is the amount of data from project A, B, C? What are the trends also? Maybe I will run out of storage or fast storage in the next uh, few months because I have this new project going on. And now uh, we are going to enter a bit more in, I would say, the IT things. So if we look at the storage um, in computer science, there is this well-known pyramid. So we can have super fast storage, sub nanosecond. So typically, if you look at the processor, the CPU itself, the L1 cache is able to deliver data in less than one cycle. So if my, if my CPU is uh, running at 2 or 3 gigahertz, so in a fraction of a nanosecond, I can get uh, data. So sadly, uh, it's very limited amount. So it's few kilobytes. And then I have different layer of cache on my uh, CPU. And then I have HBA maybe on the top of my CPU. And the idea is that the further you go from the CPU, the longer is the latency. So it's taking more uh, time, more nanosecond to access to the data. But however, the, the cost of the storage, the capacity is increasing. So typically on my L3 cache, on my processor, I have few megabytes. And on my uh, storage layer, I have few terabyte, gigabyte, uh, terabyte or petabyte. And this latency is increasing. So on the socket, we are talking about cycle. And then we are, when we are out of the socket, we talk in terms of nanosecond. So typically, the memory, the memory, few gigabytes of addressable memory is in the range of 40 to 100 uh, nanoseconds. And then we go into the uh, area of the persistent storage. And there is one very important border, which is basically the microsecond. This is an important threshold because microsecond is basically the ping latency of, of a fast HPC network. So if I'm below one microsecond, I would say that the overhead of the network would be unbearable. It's too expensive. But when we are talking about something which is a range of 10 seconds, then one microsecond is completely negligible. So it makes sense to have a, a network attached solution. So basically, this microsecond latency is a border between what should I have uh, local storage within my node, or should I have a network storage, a network attached storage? And the current status of the storage solution, the fastest NVMe on the market, in the range of 10 to 40 uh, microsecond, which means that the overhead of the network is between 10% to 2%. So then I have to arbitrate, should I be within the node, or should I uh, be outside of the node? So let's see, uh, what do we have today in, uh, uh, I will say, uh, uh, state-of-the-art AI solution. So we took, of course, uh, the DGX from NVIDIA. We opened the box and we look a bit at how oh, 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 is it organized in terms of storage. So the, the machine on the left, you have this GPU. So this is really the current JOL of the, of the system. And then in pink, you have these various uh, storage things. So the HBM, I, uh, I bandwidth memory. And then you have the memory itself, so two terabytes. And Within the DGX itself, there is storage. So there is several NVMe up to 30 terabytes. Very fast storage, actually. 
and you have all this network connectivity which is provided with the DGX and it's quite impressive actually there is eight network interface which are dedicated to interconnect various DGX so you can build basically a super fast parallel computer out of it but there's also two interfaces which are very interesting for us because they are dedicated to storage so typically this is where us DDN we plug our storage solution and now we want to say okay where should I put my data on this fast NVMe within the box or outside the box on my uh, DDN storage so of course within the box you cannot go over 30 terabyte because you cannot add more NVMe and if you are outside of the box if you are in the uh, DDN things then I mean it's a luster system so you can scale to 100 of petabytes so there is no issue so we, we run some benchmark to say okay where should I put my data so the first thing is that let's check the bandwidth so in terms of bandwidth could seems a bit counterintuitive but actually it's much faster to move data from the GPU to the network so it's much faster to feed the GPU from um, the network attached storage from the remote storage than from the local NVMe and there is of course an explanation it's the number of PCI lane which are dedicated to the network versus the number of PCI lane dedicated to the internal storage and this is true for read and for write so these numbers are coming from the A A100 uh, we have not benchmarked yet the H100 it just arrived in the lab so I would say here it's not really matching my idea of a storage pyramid because it seems that even if I'm away if, if I'm on the high capacity things it's still much more interesting to put everything on this high capacity tier so I don't need the local storage if my data set is low uh, smaller than two terabyte I put everything in memory for sure and then this 30 terabyte and we put everything on the remote storage so I don't need this so I can't question why do I have internal storage then but bandwidth is just part of the equation so now if instead of moving a lot of data I want to access a lot of small data so now I'm becoming latency driven so we can imagine that I'm randomly cherry-picking tons of small images on a huge data set then I'm completely latency driven it's not the idea of moving you know one terabyte of data and then when I'm running the same uh, not the same but so this again this benchmark so FIO small random uh, IO what I do observe is that suddenly the internal storage provided by Nvidia is outperforming quite by far the capabilities of the uh, remote storage both for read and for write so it means that the latency is much better and of course there is some reason here so you pay the overhead of the network that's pretty clear and there is also some physical things when you have 30 centimeter of uh, distance for the signal it's not the same than 30 meters so for the kind of speeds that we're talking about yes the speed of light matters so latency wise it's much more interesting to work with this internal storage so then I retrieve my nice notion of pyramid, small data set memory, larger data set internal storage, very large data set, then I go to the remote storage. So now it's, uh, I, I have both benchmark for bandwidth and latency, but the issue is that I have, I'm a scientist, I don't really care about where I should put my data, how can I handle this? And so just one more thing on, on latency here, we have mentioned GPU direct, so the idea is that before this I will say innovation um, in order to move data from the network to the GPU it was mandatory to do a kind of a trampoline from the CPU memory so I talk to the CPU the CPU brings the data then I, uh, the GPU is able to fetch the data from the CPU memory it works for sure but this additional step was I will say uh, additional op for the latency so basically we are degrading the latency with GPU direct what we do have is a capability from the GPU to talk directly to the network. So of course the bandwidth is higher, but I don't think this is really what is important for me. What is really important is that we are reducing dramatically the latency. So it means that access to small data is not going to be much cheaper than it used to be. So this is really important and for, for us this is having the ability to implement uh, GDS jointly with uh, NVIDIA was a uh, uh, I mean, we are quite pr uh, proud of it. Now, how do we try to harness the fact that I have my big fat storage uh, 
attached on the network, but I have my small storage within the node and I don't want to manually move my data around. So what we did is basically we did a lot of uh, software development and we provide a single namespace, which means that the file system is basically able to, is aware of the existence of this internal drive and is able to uh, include this drive within the namespace. So for me as an end user, this is transparent. I, had, I do not have to manage the fact that there is basically two storage uh, tiers. It's going to be uh, handled by Luster. So this is just a, a figure, uh, conceptual figure of the implementation and the code was not uh, completely trivial to uh, to finalize. So what it's providing me, so basically it means that I have my shared infrastructure, so the, the storage, the DDN storage, and I have my GPU. If I feed the data local in the local NVMe, then it means that my shared infrastructure is available for something else. So I can serve other requests, other customers, other uh, jobs. And I'm still able to process and to feed my, my GPU locally. At the opposite, when I want to basically checkpoint my model, when I, I don't, I want to move data out of the GPU, I don't need to displace the data that I've previously stored on my uh, local storage. I still keep my uh, very nice uh, cat dataset in, and I write directly on the Luster file system. And then it means that I can re I can resume my processing. So there is no uh, uh, need to move data in and out. So basically, my GPU are always busy. So that's that's the goal here. And so this is for of course this is uh, everything is oversimplified here, but we what we do for us is that. This ability to uh, encompass the local storage within the single namespace, it makes our, our resource easier to manage and to share with other users. And we see more complex I.O. pattern with the rise of this generative AI, where basically we are writing more data. Before, AI used to be mostly read but driven, but now we see a lot of write traffic. So it means that having the ability to have this versatile storage is quite important if you want to be I will say future proof. So overall, all this software uh, layer, it has been packaged in what we call the Exa6. So it's, it's our core product. And around it, we have different, like it's like an onion. We have different uh, level of um, services and features. So there are some which are dedicated to AI. So security, GPU direct, multiple protocol to be able to ingest all this data. We still have, of course, or I will say our DNA at uh, DDN is really HPC. So all this, this nice thing. And then, so this, this software things, which is flexible and versatile, we have packaged it on a hardware. So it's an appliance, which means that basically everything has been quite uh, finely tuned for the specific hardware. We do some default, default presetting for the AI workload, what we consider as being general purpose AI workload. And then we have something which is prepackaged and which is turnkey. So this is something which it's a demand that we have from more customers that they say, okay, I want to start AI, but I don't want to look at the whole complexity at the beginning. Just give me something. I plug it in my rack, I turn it on and then I, I have my data solution and I can focus on my algorithm. So this is all for today.